Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Biala Bacci, and I'm, it's my pleasure to be here to uh, introduce Dr. Gabor Mate. Uh, Gabor is a medical doctor with large experience, and he's a bestseller publishing author, has published four books that are translated into like 20 languages and has done strong work in the area of harm reduction and uh, trauma and has also played a, a strong role in, in drug reform policy in Canada and has, a, has been helping facilitate ayahuasca retreats for eight years and he's a big voice in this field and he's a keynote speak, speaker in our plant medicine track. I'm very happy to, to announce him. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, I'll introduce her. Just I'll, I'll, I'll introduce her. Thank you for this um, raucous welcome. Um, I've met somebody today, uh, just momentarily in the hall, and uh, her name is Kirsten, and she suggested and uh, offered to lead a very brief meditational process, so I've invited her to, to begin our session with that. So, Kirsten? Yeah. Good afternoon. Let's take a deep, grateful breath in gratitude to MAPS. Thank you for all your work. Deep breath out. May the research continue to expand. Let's take another deep breath in. Dedicate this to plant medicine. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Deep breath out. May it reach all the souls with the wisdom that we're learning. And the third breath, let's dedicate it to you, Gavar Mate. Thank you so much. Everybody take a huge deep breath in. Thank you for your wisdom. Deep breath out. May it reach the souls that still suffer from trauma. May they find relief. Aho. Aho. Thank you. Ten years ago, which was... Uh, close to the end of my uh, clinical work as a physician, if you had uh, told me that I'd be addressing hundreds of people at a psychedelic conference, <laughs> I wouldn't know what drugs you were taking. <laughs> that I am here speaking to you and that you're here listening to me uh, reflects both the crisis of Western society and also the wisdom of uh, cultures that in our arrogance we ignore and even uh, suppress. Now, psychedelics, as you know, uh, have been used, uh, and plant medicines have been used by humankind for ages. In fact, um, one of my favorite books is uh, Homer's Iliad and then the Odyssey. And rereading the Odyssey just a few months ago, there it is, plant medicine, this, this book was written down, composed probably 2,700 years ago and, uh, and uh, written down maybe 25, 2,400 years ago. And the hero, Decius, is heading home from the Trojan Wars and is going to uh, suffer many setbacks and blockages along the way. And at one point, he is telling his story to some, uh, some of his hosts on his way home to his uh, island. And this deep sadness that overcomes the company at the losses and traumas that they had endured in the Trojan War. And then Helen, the uh, face that launched a thousand ships, who was at this dinner, then gives them a plant medicine. So I'm just going to read you these few passages from Homer about what happens. Then Zeus's daughter, Helen, thought of something else. Into the mixing bowl from which they drank their wine, she slipped a drug, heart's ease, dissolving anger, magic to make us all forget our pains. No one who drank it deeply, mulled in wine, could let a tear roll down his cheeks that day. Not even, his mother, not even if his mother should die, his father die. Not even if right before his eyes, some enemy brought down a brother or darling son with a sharp bronze blade. So the power of the plant medicines to ease uh, human suffering. 
Uh, let me begin with the story of suffering. This is um, a woman who has um, a condition called scleroderma. And scleroderma is an um, autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks the body and basically destroys it. Sclero, uh, sclerosis um, has to do with hardening, and derm is the skin. So scleroderma is a hardening of not just the skin, but the connective tissues uh, in the skin and in the joints and in, in the muscles. So people with scleroderma literally become rigid. And this woman um, was so rigid that if you took a look at the photograph of her three or four years ago, her face was like a rigid, distorted grimace of a mask. And although she was a highly capable executive um, assistant to a leading international researcher at Harvard, at the full-blown height of her disease, she literally could no longer type because her hands were too rigid to move her digits. And she was lying in bed and could not get up without assistance. And uh, this is what she writes. Now, when I say this is what she writes, that gives you a clue that she's no longer in that state. She's writing now. She's actually writing her biography. And um, she just sent me an email today about the writing and how excited she's about the writing. But literally, uh, three, four years ago, she could not even touch the keyboard without it causing too much pain, and she couldn't manipulate her fingers. And so this is her memoir. Feeling my skin tighten with the cruelty of a balloon that won't pop, I'd watched my face harden against my skull like a lifeless reconstruction of a prehistoric head from ancient remains. With gravity wrenching at my every aching joint, my only thought for so long was how I would have welcomed the warm black dull of sleep over anything in the living world. I hadn't slept in nearly two years, the dark under my eyes waxing like a black moon. Night after night, I lay in my bed, unable to remain in a single position for more than 15 minutes, rolling like a broken tortoise, side back side throughout the night. In an act of mercy, I would occasionally fall into depths of my unconscious, only to return to a body that had been tortured while I had drifted desperately into the hungry twilight. Oh, how I paid for every scrap of sleep I stole. My eyes somewhere, somehow always closed and always seeing, somehow always dead and always dreaming. And then what she did, and I don't recommend that she try this at home, kids, but what she did, because she was unable to um, attend or travel anywhere, she could not even get out of bed without assistance, she could not move around without a wheelchair, she actually ordered some ayahuasca online. Again, I'm not suggesting you try this at home. <laughs> but she did. She drank the ayahuasca, and that night she stood up independently for the first time in a couple of years. She has since traveled to uh, a foreign country where we do our ayahuasca retreat. She walks without assistance. She's mobile. She's active. She's writing her biography. All this despite the fact that all the Western medicine she was given had failed and the physicians had written her off for dead. In fact, all she wanted was to get an assisted suicide until she discovered some of my work on the mind-body unity and she discovered ayahuasca. Now, that speaks to a number of issues. Number one, obviously, it speaks to the potential of the plant medicines which I'll return to later. Number two, it uh, speaks to the nature of disease. Now, disease in North America and in Western medical ideology is perceived as a biological entity that strikes people for either genetic reasons that we can identify or for causes that are, have to do with random bad luck, which we cannot identify. But in any case, the disease is seen as purely as a biological event, and the solutions are only biological, in the sense that the best we can do with chronic illness, like autoimmune diseases, mental health conditions, um, and often cancer, is to mitigate its symptoms, but not to actually heal 
the underlying condition. And that's the best that Western medicine has to offer. Now, as, as a physician, I'm well aware of the miracles of uh, cure that Western medical practice can also offer in many acute conditions. But we're really uh, inept at dealing with chronic conditions uh, of the mind and the body. And if we're inept, it must be because we don't quite get what it's all about. And if we're looking in the wrong direction, we'll never find uh, the answers. Now, a big difference between Western medicine and shamanic medicine is that Western medicine cleaves the mind and the body, let alone the spirit that it's not even aware of, into separate entities, and it considers that they have no impact on one another, no relationship to one another when it comes to health and illness. The reality is otherwise. The reality actually is that you cannot separate mind from the body uh, in health or in illness. And let me just give you an example. A study last year showed that amongst American black women, the most, more experience of racism a black woman has had to endure, the greater her risk for asthma. So there's something about the nature of racism that clearly stresses the individual, and that stress can cause a perturbation of her lung functioning. This may seem mysterious, but it isn't at all when we consider also the studies that show that the more stressed the parents are, the more likely the kid is to have asthma. And of course, how we treat asthma is with stress hormones. Clearly, chronic stress disorganizes the immune system and through the connections with, of the emotional brain with the nervous system, it actually constricts the, uh, blood, uh, the airflow to the, uh, to the lungs. Is that the problem of an individual? Well, clearly not. The child whose parents are stressed and who suffers asthma is clearly stressed by the stresses of her parents. But what are the stre parents stressed by? They're stressed by life in a particular society as we can show in the case of the black women whose asthma rate increases as racism increases. So can we say, therefore, that the asthma is the disease of an individual person, of a single, isolated human being? We cannot say that. We have to explain and understand that the asthma is actually a manifestation of a whole culture and a whole way of living, as it has an impact on the psychology and therefore the immunology and therefore the physiology of a human being, which is to say that the only rational scientific way to understand human beings is that we are biopsychosocial creatures, which is to say that our biology interacts with and is affected by our psychological and social relationships, which also means by the culture and society that we live in. Now, if we look at the society that we live in, and speaking specifically of the United States, which uh, uses up a huge proportion of the world's resources and is ever hungry for more. So in this uh, resource um, splurging, incredibly wealthy culture, we have 50% of the adult population with chronic illness. Something like 70% of adults are on some kind of medication or another. Now, if in a laboratory you were growing microorganisms, uh, bacteria, for example, in a culture broth. We call it a culture. We're culturing bacteria in a broth. And if 50 to 70 percent of those microorganisms were ill, dysfunctional, what would you call that culture? You'd call it a toxic culture. My statement is, my observation is, is that we live in a toxic culture. We actually live in a culture that makes people sick. And uh, we have to look at the reasons why. And when we understand the reasons why, and when we also understand how shamanic and plant medicines work, then we get the glimpse, the possibility, that maybe there's another way of understanding human beings, and therefore there's another way of healing. So what happens then, to take the case of uh, the scleroderma I just told you about, this woman had been to doctors for many, many, many years as, his as her condition deteriorated. 
And one little thing that nobody asked her was what her history was, what her emotional states were, what her personality patterns and emotional dynamics were. That did not occur to any of the specialists that treated her. It was all about the biological manifestations of the disease and how do we control them with different kind of drugs. When I asked her, well, tell me about your childhood. She told me what everybody with chronic illness tells me, that there was significant trauma. In her case, she was a Korean woman who um, was given up by her birth mother, and at one year of age, she was adopted by an American evangelical couple who brought her to the United States. The adoptive mother then had a nervous breakdown when my friend was four or five years old, an enormous stress on her child. And the adoptive father, in a fit of religious remorse, when she was 16 or 17, confessed to her that he had sexually abused her from age two to age six or something like that, which she had not recalled. She had totally repressed that, that memory. Which is to say that the basis of many adult illnesses is actually trauma. Now, I'm not going to go into the mechanisms by which trauma causes illness. I'm just going to state the fact that it does, and I'm also going to state the fact that in all cases of chronic illness, when you actually look at the childhood experience, there were significant traumatic incidents or, or influences. All I'm going to tell you is what trauma actually is in my understanding. So trauma is not these terrible things that happen to people. What trauma actually is, fundamentally, is a disconnect from the self a disconnect from the body and disconnect from the, from the essential self. Why do people disconnect? Because it's too painful to be connected. So that disconnection is not a mistake, it's not an um, accident, it's actually a coping mechanism. When you're being hurt and you have no recourse to help or escape or fight, then in order to endure the hurt, you're going to have to just adapt somehow. And how do you adapt? You adapt, uh, one way to adapt is to disconnect from the self. Now you no longer are in touch with your feelings and with your gut feelings or with your emotions. And that means that you start living life inauthentically. Now, coping mechanisms that in the short term help the child endure can become the source of pathology later on. In fact, invariably they do. And this is recognized actually in scientific research and in medical research. It's just not recognized in medical practice. So I'm going to quote you from an article from the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Association. And the article is from Harvard University. And they say, growing, growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the very things that a child automatically and unconsciously does to endure early stress will become a source of pathology and dysfunction later on. And there's all kinds of scientific evidence, not only of how this is so, but why this is so. Which means to say that when you see somebody with a mental illness, um, let, let me just give you an example of depression as a, as, as a case of how a coping mechanism becomes a so-called disease. So if you look at the word depression itself, what does it mean to depress something? It means to push it down. And if you've ever been depressed, what gets pushed down are the emotions. There's a kind of flatness to life. Well, why would somebody push down their emotions? They would push down their emotions if those emotions are very painful and if there's no holding environment when those emotions can be experienced and, and processed. As in the case of a child whose parents are too stressed, too dissociated themselves, too traumatized, too unavailable to help the child um, move through the natural pain and, 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 and fear and grief that life will cause. Well then, how does such a child, and the anger that may arise, how does such a child then deal with uh, those difficult emotions? Pushes it down. And 20 years later, 30 years later, diagnosed with depression. Another medical profession says, you've got this brain disease. 
you probably inherited it, and it's biological. And the only solution is a biological one. Here's a drug that you can take for the next 20 years. Instead of actually looking at the original cause and how to help that people, how to help that person reconnect with themselves so they can feel their emotions and experience their pain and their grief and their anger, whatever else happens to be there. Now, that's the Western medical model. So not only does life experience in this society traumatize a lot of people, then the treatment model is such that it narrows down the understanding of what happened to them to a single, simple biological entity that then we basically control by means of pharmaceuticals. And that's largely the Western medical mindset in which I was trained and which doctors continue to be trained. And I won't even go into great detail about brain development, because when we talk about uh, addictions or depression or anxiety as diseases of the brain, which we talk about as if they were biological entities lodged in the brain purely, we're ignoring some simple little fact, which is that the brain itself develops an interaction with the environment. So in the same Harvard article, they talk about how the fact that the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth, so already what happens to pregnant women will have an impact on the brain development of the child and continues into adulthood. And then they say, the interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. Which means to say that the critical influence on the physiological development of the brain circuits implicated in all mental illness and addictive behaviors is actually the quality of parent-child relationships. Which then, if you look at what's happening on a social level, when depression and anxiety are the fastest growing diagnoses on our campuses, both in Canada and the US, anxiety is the fastest growing diagnosis. When according to the World Health Organization, we're seeing five times as much depression as we saw 10 years ago, we cannot be looking at genetic factors, because genes don't change in the population over 5, 20, or 30, or 40, or even 400 years. What we're looking at is the impact of stress on the pending environment. And what is causing that stress? The growing inequality. In the United States, the top 1% of the population has a 15-year-old longer expected life expectancy than the bottom 1%. Inequality kills you. Social stress. Uh, the, every time a Walmart goes up or a Costco goes up and local stores die, and now you get into your car, instead of walking to your neighborhood store, you get into your car all by yourself, and you go to a place where you don't know anybody, well, you might get it for cheaper, the goods that you're looking for, but you also lost social connections. And social isolation kills people. People who are isolated will die, get sicker quicker, and die sooner of their diseases. Because again, the biology of people cannot be isolated from the social and, and, and emotional and, 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 and psychological environments. And all you have to do is remember the death of Debbie Reynolds one day after the death of her daughter, Carrie Fisher. You think her stroke was an accident? It was a response to uh, unbearable pain. Because you can't separate people's biology from their emotions. Now, in contrast to the Western view, schematic medicine, plant medicinal practices, has always assumed, or I shouldn't say assumed, but known intuitively that mind and body are inseparable. So when the shamans work with you, they don't make a distinction between your mind and your body. It's all one unit. And so in the ayahuasca ceremony, when the chanting takes place, that chanting is very directly aimed at whatever is happening to you on a bodily, energetic level, which also shows up in your emotional states and in your thoughts, so that it's a completely holistic practice. So even if you did not allow any uh, credibility to the power of the plant itself, the very nature of the healer and um, you might say, recipient interaction is, is healing. 
because they're working with the whole mind-body unity. Number one. Number two, as my friend Peter Levine, who's a leading trauma researcher, writes in his book, In an Unspoken Voice, he says, um, rather than being a disease in the classical sense, and he's talking about trauma, and I'm saying that trauma is at the heart of virtually all illness, Um, rather than being a disease in the classical sense, trauma is instead a profound experience of dis-ease or disorder. What is called for here is a cooperative and restorative process with the doctor as an assisting guide and midwife. A midwife to what? A midwife to the rebirth of that individual as a whole unified organic um, entity. That, uh, that unified entity that was cleaved when trauma happened and the person had to disconnect from themselves in order to not to endure so much pain. So if you look at the essence of uh, trauma, it is actually that, as I said before, that disconnection uh, from the self. And that is expressed very well by... Um, two spiritual teachers. Uh, one of them is Eckhart Tolle, who says, basically all emotions are modifications of one primordial, undifferentiated emotion that has its origin in the loss of awareness um, of who you are beyond name and form. In other words, the loss of the true self. Because of its undifferentiated nature, it is hard to find a name for that, preci that precisely describes this emotion. Fear comes close, but apart from a continuous sense of threat, it also includes a deep sense of abandonment and incompleteness. It may be best to use a term that is as undifferentiated as the basic emotion and simply call it pain. And another teacher, um, A. H. Almas, says, talking about childhood, that the fundamental thing that happened and the greatest calamity is not that there was no love or support. The greater calamity, which was caused by that first calamity, is that you lost the connection to your essence. That is much more important than whether your mother or father loved you or not. Well, that's really good news. Because, uh, because if the trauma was uh, that you were sexually abused, or that your parents were too depressed to really connect with you, or too stressed to be emotionally available to you, or if they hit you or, or emotionally um, stressed you, if that was the trauma, then unfortunately it's over because that happened decades ago. But if the trauma is actually the loss of self, loss of connection to self, then that self can be reconnected with at any time. And when we talk about say, the healing of addiction, what's the word for that? We call it recovery. And recovery, of course, very specifically means the finding of something, the finding again of something. Well, what is it that's recovered or found again in the recovery from addiction? Well, I mean, you ask people, just what did you find when you recovered? Invariably, the answer is, I found myself. So what happens in recovery is that remembering of the self which means that it's always available. Now, the other aspect of trauma is that once it happens, you, you can no longer be comfortable in the present moment. When the present moment hurt you so much that you became afraid of it, then your whole mind will be oriented towards escaping the present moment, escaping it by any means possible. And what kind of a culture do we live in? We live in a culture that is predicated and economically based on escape from the present. And that was very well expressed by the Catholic monk Thomas Merton, who uh, wrote the following, if I can just find it. And maybe I can't, but that's okay. Maybe I can. Maybe I can't. Well, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sweat it. Um, he basically said that um, society is based on the um, satisfaction of false needs and that entire industries under the 
beneficial um, wings of capitalism, our entire industries are dedicated to um, ex exciting every um, nerve in our bodies so that we can be um, focused on externally trying to uh, meet our, these false needs. And that it's all about escape, whether you're talking about the products of our factories or the products of our entertainment industry, we're looking for the most part at escaping from ourselves. So, A, we live in a society that causes us to escape from ourselves. And why is that? It's because, as I said earlier, a connection has been lost. Now, if human life began at that wall over there, when I say human life, I don't mean our current species. I mean hominid existence on the earth, uh, human-like or humanoid precursor uh, species. If, the, if they began their existence on earth two million years ago, which is about right, which is that wall over there, and then if that door there represents modern society, then until this far away from that wall, we lived in hunter-gatherer groups, small band hunter-gatherer groups, which means that we lived in a social context, intimately related to other human beings, and children were never separated from their parents, and children were always picked up. No primordial human being, just as no uh, cat or no orangutan, would allow a baby to be distressed and not go to their help. Whereas in our society, we tell people to let their babies cry to go back to sleep. So we become disconnected from other people. Uh, we no longer live in those, gather, in those close groupings. In other words, we evolved as social creatures. The whole um, ideology of human beings as competitive, individualistic, and aggressive is simply a reflection of the kind of values that this society thrives on. When I say this society thrives on, I don't mean that we as human beings thrive on it. I mean the people that derive profits thrive on an ideology that creates human beings as individualistic, aggressive, and competitive. It justifies the very nature of the society. So they create an image of human beings that reflects the needs of the dominant groups, but they don't reflect real human nature. Real human nature, evolutionarily, could not have survived unless it was cooperative, compassionate, and uh, social. So when we have a society that denies basic human nature and then creates false needs where our real needs are not being met, now we have false needs that have to be met and we're all chasing these false needs, what are you going to get? It's a lot of disconnection and a lot of stressed people. And as a result, a lot of stressed children. And how does that show up? It shows up in the millions of children being medicated for all kinds of met uh, mental health conditions. And people are wondering, what's this all about? What's this all about is the very toxic nature of this culture. Now, if you look at uh, the research on what is the optimal parenting environment, the optimal parenting environment, guess what? Is the hunter-gatherer tribe, where children have connections to many adults, where many adults serve as parents, where um, children are always with the adults, and they grow up under adult leadership, and people are cooperative. So I'm going to read you a description. And such human beings still exist on the Earth, although thanks to the benefits of globalization, there are fewer and fewer of them, and they're going to be fewer yet, uh, as we can probably predict. But this is from a book called um, um, Memoirs of an Addicted Brain by uh, Mark Lewis. And Mark Lewis is describing um, a journey to the Malay Peninsula where he was doing some research. Let me read you um, a description of two human beings that might seem quite wondrous and strange to you, but it actually reflects who human beings are. Just before reaching the highlands, almost desperate now for a shower and a normal meal, I met a pair of Orang Azli, these were tribesmen, who looked like they just stepped out of a time machine. I was ahead of the others, so I was the first to see them. A man and a boy of 10 or 12, father and son, I was sure. They stood so still that I almost bumped into them, and my first reaction was fear. The man held a blowgun by his side. 
It was, a long, it was as long as he was tall, and I knew it was equipped with a poison-tipped dart. He held it casually upright beside him. He wore only a loincloth. The boy was completely naked. We gaped at each other, maybe for just a minute, but it seemed much longer. The man looked strong and confident and proud, not the kind of proud that comes from collected accomplishments, but the kind that comes from being completely at home in the world. Now, the Buddha said that with our minds we create the world. With our thoughts we create the world. What he didn't say, and this is modern psychology's job, is to point out that before with our minds we create the world, our, the world creates our minds. So, the kind of minds that this culture, by and large, creates, see the world in a particular way, and then they inhabit that world that their minds created. So, if somebody says that the world is a horrible place, they're going to live in a very different world than somebody who believes and knows that the world is a place of beauty and pain, of potential, of loss, of presence, of companionship, of uh, compassion, and of suffering. Those two individuals live in very different worlds. There is a man who said verbatim that the world is a horrible place, and he's the president of the United States right now. <laughs> yes. And what created that world in his mind? The childhood trauma that he endured in, uh, in a family where the father was a rageaholic autocrat who demeaned his children and the mother who couldn't protect him. And his brother died of alcoholic disease. But this man now has to engrandize himself and be very powerful and have a big penis and uh, everything to compensate for his actual smallness, which is what his core belief is and for which he's trying every moment of his desperate life to compensate. It's the nature of a traumatic society that such a man becomes our leader. Anyway, the, uh, the man looked strong and confident and proud. Not the kind of proud that comes from collected accomplishments, but the kind that comes from being completely at home in the world. His smile was magnificent. He seemed to revel in this unfathomable moment. There was nothing he needed to say or do. But the boy's expression and stance were even more remarkable. He regarded me with a face so open, so unclouded, that it seemed to lie outside the repertoire of the human. His eyes were a window between his body and the world outside him, uninterrupted by the opacity of self. Have you ever looked at the world uninterrupted by the opacity of this artificial self that you believe yourself to be? And that's where the plant medicines comes in, by the way, because they allow you to do just that. Not an atom of self-consciousness, not a hint of anxiety, no shyness, no attempt to please. For days I tried to understand what I had seen in this boy, and bit by bit it came to me. He knew himself instinctively, without a self-image to maintain and adjust, without norms and standards by which to evaluate himself. He felt exactly what it was like to be at home in himself, and ask yourself, how often have you felt completely at home in yourself? And for this I envied him enormously, because no matter how hard I tried, and despite my additional years, I couldn't find myself, couldn't know myself, not like that. All I could find was a collection of evaluations. Now that not knowing oneself, again, is the essence of trauma. The boy stood completely still with his father's hand on his shoulder. There was no flinching away in anxiety, no concern that he would do the wrong thing and shatter the delicate father-son relationship, no contracting in shame because his father knew him and accepted him completely, no concern about being too strong because there was no way that would be taken as a challenge, no fear of being too weak because his father, his family, and his tribe were there to protect him. These were my conclusions, and maybe they were etched part way between rational conjecture and wishful thinking. But beyond envy, the experience gave me a sense of optimism. Watching that almost half-man standing on the path near his home, reflecting later on what I had seen in his posture and in his face, I was left feeling amazed and hopeful. 
it was possible to be wide open and unafraid in this world, it was at least possible. Now, that is what it means to be a human being, to be actually open and unafraid in this world and connected to oneself. So, it was eight years ago that I first, uh, nine years ago now, that I first found out about um, plant medicines. And it was simply because after the publication of my book on addiction in the realm of hunger ghosts, I kept getting all these inquiries as to what I know about addiction, and which was based on the idea that addiction is rooted in trauma. Um, I began to get many inquiries about what I knew about the healing of addiction through plant medicine, especially ayahuasca. And I knew nothing about it. I was even getting irritated with the question because I, you know, keep a, don't ask me things I don't know about. I just read a 400 page book. Can you ask me about something I know about? <laughs> but, the, but the question, the question kept intruding on me until finally I understood that I was getting a message. <laughs> And I had the opportunity to participate in a ceremony. And immediately I saw the possibility. Because two things can happen. When you do um, ayahuasca specifically, but I think other psychedelic plants um, and, and perhaps substances, parts of the brain that are usually suppressed become activated and they speak to you, including some of your deepest, most hurtful childhood memories. So two years ago, at the tender age of 71, I participated in a psilocybin uh, experience uh, in San Francisco. And I was lying on the mat, and the woman I was working with was just sitting next to beside me, and all of a sudden, I just started crying, just, just sobbing. And I saw her, and I was present as an adult. I knew that I was in San Francisco. I knew that I was having a plant experience, and I knew that this woman was a healer. But at the same time, I was a six-month-old infant, and she was my mother. So two aspects were present, my deepest emotional childhood memories and my awareness as an adult. And I said to her words that I'm sure I would have wanted to say to my mother at six months of age, as a Jewish infant of the Nazi occupation in Budapest, when she had such a hard time to keep us alive and our life was under threat almost daily. And the words that came out of my mouth, and in which I mouth articulated to this therapist was, I'm so sorry for having made your life so difficult. Now imagine the burden on a six-month-old of that kind of consciousness. And imagine the freedom that can occur when you can release that burden. You can actually voice it. And it's received. So in the plant experience, you are um, able to revisit the traumas or the disconnects that happened long, long time ago, but you can do so in a safe, supported environment and in the presence of people that can hold you, which is your parents couldn't do, which is why you were traumatized in the first place. That's the one thing that they can do. And that's powerful work. I'm not saying it's instantaneous, I'm not saying it's immediate, and I'm not saying that everything changes all of a sudden because you've had that experience, but it opens up a whole slew of possibilities for healing or reconnection with the self, which is the essence of recovery, is when you reconnect with the self. The, in other words, you get to experience what it was that got between you and the self in the first place. And then secondly, on a deeper level, in my first experience of the plant, I just experienced deep love. And I remembered and understood with some self-compassion how I had actually run away from love so often in my life. How I had betrayed love, in fact, because it was so vulnerable. Because in the first place when I loved, I was hurt. So then you spend your life escaping from love or looking for it in the wrong places. 
But when you reconnect with love, you connect with who you are, because that's who we are. That's our essence. It has to be our essence, because without it, we'd never have survived as a species. In short, uh, to encapsulate the, the plant medicine experience in the right context, and I have to really emphasize the right context, you experience how you lost that connection, but you experience also what you were disconnected from, which is your true essential self. Now that's a simple, a simplified statement of it, but that is the process. That is the process that opens up, that these plant medicines make available to you. So, not only that, as Peter Levine says in his book, there's something else here as well. He says, in uh, contrast to the Western medical approach where I am the expert and I'm going to cure you, in the shamanic traditions, he says, contrast the alignment to that of the shamanic traditions where the healer and the sufferer join together to re-experience the terror while calling on cosmic forces to release the grip of the demons. The shaman is always first initiated by a profound encounter with his own helplessness and feeling of being shattered prior to assuming the role of the mantle of the healer. Such preparation might suggest a model whereby contemporary therapists must first recognize and engage with their own traumas and emotional wounds. Now, you know, that's just the opposite of what we do in medical training, you know, just the opposite. So that's why I'm saying that even if we leave out the use of the plants, just absorbing the lessons of the plant traditions and to the therapeutic model will go a long way towards uh, restoring healing to, uh, to uh, psychological and uh, psychiatric and uh, medical healing. And there's one more quote I wanted to give you if I can possibly find it. And again, I've, I've lost it. Just give you one quick second, and if I don't find it, well, you know what? Indulge me for 10 seconds, because I do want to find this one. Yeah, here it is. This is from a book called The Story Waiting to Pierce You, which is about Tibetan shamanism. And um, remembering, he says, is simply a matter of recollecting the essence of ourselves. And then he says, when it comes to how difficult it is in our society to get this message across, to get it accepted, to get it understood, because there's powerful resistance to it. But just ponder these words. He says, times change are always slipping and shifting. Things that once were necessary, are allowable, are not even possible anymore because the energies and opportunities are no longer the same. Suddenly the directions of life have switched and a new path opens up for us ahead. And I'm suggesting that here at this conference and with this kind of work, we're actually forging a new path. Uh, suddenly, suddenly the directions of life have switched and a new path opens up for us ahead, full of obstacles to begin with, but easier and easier for anyone to follow as soon as the first travelers have cleared the way. Before we know it, Yesterday's, impo yesterday's impossibility will be tomorrow's laziness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, we have a few minutes, seven minutes or so for questions or comments. So where's the mic? Um, or we has got the mic right here. Uh, let me just uh, give an apology. Um, I know that books are for sale here. Uh, within half an hour of this event ending, I have to leave, catch a plane to my next gig in Salt Lake City. So I won't be here. I'm so sorry. I'd like to have met many of you and talk with you, but that won't happen. Um, um, 
you're welcome to visit my website. And uh, in uh, this year, we'll be offering online courses on addiction and other things. So you're welcome to check that out and get on the mailing list. For now, I'll take questions. And then in seven minutes, I'll bid goodbye. OK, go ahead. Hi. Hi. My name is Kira. Um, I really appreciate the space that you made in your talk to mention toxic culture and colonization. Um, and I feel like, uh, especially in the psychedelic realm, there tends to be a lot of um, unchecked cultural appropriation and privileges that can go into these practices, especially in the realm of ayahuasca and folks come like going from outside of their culture to kind of um, just spend thousands of dollars and like get somebody to facilitate an, an ayahuasca ceremony. And I don't think that that's always a bad thing, but I'm just wondering if there's ways that Westerners can show more solidarity. Um, yeah. In their uh, so, so thank you. I think yeah. that the people that are committed to this work and who do it seriously are very aware of what you're talking about and they really honor the native traditions and they actually support um, the, the um, protection of the uh, Amazon jungle and, and, and the uh, respect for native traditions. At the same time, there's going to be a lot of exploitation and appropriation, just to suggest there's not a whole lot we can do about that. Uh, in this culture where we can forge a different path and show a different model and hope to draw people to it. Okay. We're filming, so... Uh, Say something. Okay. Hi, so my question is around um, supporting our um, families and friends that have different um, illnesses and health stuff going on who can't always go to Peru and work with the Shipibo. What are some of the um, like programs that you know um, to support family members and people that have serious illness and other things? Like, What are some of the resources beyond um, going to Peru that many young people around my age are doing, but it's not accessible to others? Well, the plant medicines are always going to be uh, in the foreseeable future, and I think in the long-term future, a minuscule um, drop of one thousandth of one percent of what's accessible to people. That's just the nature of the culture. So there's got to be um, treatment modalities that understand these principles. For all the research that MAPS will do, it's going to take a long time before, say, MDMA, which is not a plant medicine, but MDMA is really available to many, 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 many people to heal PTSD, for example, because it'll take a long time to train that many practitioners and to make it available. Uh, so there's got to be other modalities um, in terms of how to support family members and, and, and others who are involved in addiction or chronic illness. I don't know what to tell you except to read my books, you know, uh, uh, and to find people with that perspective, with a holistic perspective. You don't need plant medicines to have a holistic understanding of human beings. So plant medicines are great, but at least we can take the lessons of what they have to teach and apply them even to people who have no access to the plant medicines. That's the best I can tell you. Hi. Hi. So quality of parental connection, that was the part that really struck me about what you were talking about. And as a parent now of a 15, almost 16-year-old daughter who yeah. is flailing yeah. and an 8-year-old son, my question to you is, how do we create that quality when we are stressed and we're disconnected and we're in a concrete jungle and you know and and the devices and you know everyone's plugged in all the time and well, like so how look, do we do um, that? Just to be really quick and I apologize for the rapidity of my responses which made them may make them not as accurate as I might wish but um, what I'm hearing in you is a little sense of um, difficulty and blockage and and, and fear I would suggest that those have nothing to do with your children. You've had them all your life. In fact, that's what stressed your children in the first place. So my first suggestion to you is that you deal with that in yourself. And then you'll be somebody who can approach your children from a position of possibility, not of impossibility. And you can do that, and then you'll be a model to them, an invitation for their own healing. Specifically, 
I wouldn't, if you want to deal with kids, and I don't mean to be self-serving here, but I highly recommend you read my book on child development and, and called Hold On To Your Kids. That'll give you a lot of tools, but beyond any tools, it's who you're being for them that makes the biggest difference. And if, you, if you're coming from a sense of despair and um, difficulty, you're not in a position to help them, okay? And I, believe me, I know that from my own parenting. I, I've been there, done that, okay? Thank you. Hi. Oh. Hi, Dr. Vate. Thank Hi. you so much for being here. Um, so my question is about what does it mean, what does the self mean? And I'm a psychotherapist and have been trained like in the psychoanalytic tradition and like when... That's the okay, you, you can heal. <laughs> <laughs> you have a great sense of humor, by the way. Thank um, you. <laughs> no, I was, I was serious. <laughs> No, it's true. It's true. That's why we do this. Um, so okay, come on. So, so how, how do you, what is the real self? Is that what you're asking? The question is, my understanding of how the self develops in infancy is in relationship with the mother. And so if there's never a self that develops, how do you return to the self? Okay, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had the experience... No, stay with the mic. Um, have you ever had an experience where you realized that you'd done something or said something and then it was a kind of a twinge of shame afterwards because you thought, I wasn't myself there? Have you ever had that experience? I think it was connected to myself and then I felt shame. Or I believed it was connected to myself and then I felt shame. Yeah, well, there's no sense of shame in connecting with the self. Mm. Okay. Have you had the experience, is anything in that, in that tells you when you're not being yourself? It's hard to answer. Well, then you need help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and I can't give you an intellectual answer to that, because I don't want to speak to your mind. Your, oh, mind yeah. has your mind has already had a lot of training. I think the self is over, ever evolving. Okay, I'm not going to get into an intellectual discussion. I'm telling you that the self is right here in the gut. Mm. Now, have you had the experience of having a strong gut feeling, ignoring it, and being sorry afterwards? Absolutely. Okay, that's when you were not being yourself. Okay, Thank you. but the gut was there to tell you. You got to just pay attention to that. And if you don't know how to do that, you need to get help how to do that. And then you know what the self is. It's not yes. an intellectual concept. Fair enough? Uh, got it. Thank you. Thank you. This is going to be the last question, so I apologize for that, but that's, this is the last one. Hi, Dr. Monte. In 2009, I emailed you. My name is Lisana Redbear, and I asked you if you had worked with indigenous peoples up in Vancouver. Yeah. Mostly because your approach, compassionate and empathetic approach to chemical dependency treatment spoke to my heart. Mm. And I'm happy to see that this awakening in regards to indigenous plant culture has spoken to your heart. Mm. I want to express that there's a prophecy. There's a prophecy that of our ancestors that said that the colonial settler offsprings were going to come back to the indigenous people and ask us for healing mm. and ask us for our ways and our understanding. Mm. This prophecy is coming about. But in context with that, as an indigenous person, even standing here, my heart is pounding like a rabbit, a jackrabbit in my chest, because what I have to say is not going to necessarily, um, necessarily going to maybe make anybody happy. But I want to say that cultural appropriation is a form of re-traumatization to indigenous people. And that by saying that there's no accountability and there's nothing that you can do about it, that's dismissive. And it just broke my heart to hear you say it. And I know that it's within this context and you have a short amount of time, but I'm going to ask you to pray on that. Well, if that's what you heard me say, if, <laughs> listen, I, I get it. If that's what you heard me say, given your experience, I can see why it would break your heart. But when I speak to indigenous groups in Canada, which I often do, because they want to hear this message, they want to understand about their historical trauma and their current addictions, and I, I totally understand. I totally understand. What I'm saying is, I get a lot of invitations from First Nations groups, and I can't keep up with it. 
because they want to hear this message. And, um, and one of the things I say to them is that we have a lot to learn from you. That's not a, if I learn from somebody, I'm not appropriating anything. I'm just learning. So in the, in the First Nations traditions, there's a lot of communal activity and supposed of individual healing. There's a lot of chanting and ceremonial work. But here's what I'm noticing with you right now, and I'll have to finish speaking here. You're speaking from a deep wound. I'm sorry you took what I said the way you occurred to you. I'm not going to make you wrong for it, but I cannot stand here and heal your wound. I just can't do it. But, 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 but... All right, well, look, uh, I appreciate your courage in standing and challenging me, and I'm very grateful for it. Thank you, and thank you all for listening.